Hello, I'm Rick Anthony, and this is Caregiver Assist, a series of programs of, by, and for unpaid family caregivers, the more than 53 million men and women who spend, on, on average, 25 hours a week caring for care-dependent adults. They record 34 billion hours annually, valued at $470 billion, and their numbers are diminishing as the population ages, lives longer, with higher levels of morbidity. This series was inspired by my own experience as a primary caregiver for my late wife. Through interviews with experts in various aspects of family caregiving and real-life caregivers, we hope to provide information and moral support for family caregivers, especially those who also hold full-time jobs. At various times in my caregiving experience, I needed the help of people in my family, business, and social networks who know a lot more about caregiving than I. We need a new cardiologist. Who can you recommend? Has anybody had experience with this medication? Which expenses are covered by insurance and which are deductible? How do we get an extension on filing our federal income tax? Is pre-planning a good idea? And the list goes on. My guest today, Glenna Crooks, is a strategic innovator and trusted counsel to government and business leaders. In her latest venture, a story told in the network's age, Realize Your Network Superpower, she describes a new way to help people lessen the stress of modern life, addresses challenges of work-life balance, performance, productivity, and family caregiving. A graduate of Indiana University, she's a fellow of the University of Pennsylvania Center for Neuroscience and Society, and a fellow of Drexel University Center for Population Health and Community Involvement. She also sits on several boards and is the author of six books. Her next one, Longevity Pioneering, Build Your Personal Village, will be out later this year. As importantly, Glenna has been a family caregiver. She hasn't just written about it, she's lived it. Glenna, nice to see you. Uh, this is your encore appearance at uh, Mainline uh, TV 21. I, I don't remember how long ago. It was before COVID. Just before the pandemic. It was a pleasure to be with you. Before yeah. and after COVID. Uh, and the studio didn't look as luxurious as it does now. Uh, we were talking about your then book, mm-hmm. your last one, on network. And you corrected me, and you said it's not networking, it's network. Networks. And it's still, and I'm involved in networking. I always have networking. And all the people in entrepreneurial, the entrepreneurial community are involved in networking. If you don't learn it, you're better. Uh, It took me a while, though, to understand the difference between networking and building networks until I read your book. Then we had that conversation. Um, how long have you been a caregiver to your mother? Uh, along with my brother and my sister-in-law uh, for two years so far. Um, uh, they are local. The, my uh, brother and sister-in-law and my mother retired to Florida to one of those over 55 active living communities. Uh, my mother had her own house. They were in, in the same neighborhood. Yeah. Um, uh, but they uh, were the local caregivers. For most of the time, I was the distant caregiver. Although because of the flexibility in my work, there were times that I could go spend like a month Mm -hmm. and work from there and Mm -hmm. provide um, local caregiving as well. So I've had the experience of having been local, but also having been distant. You probably needed another month to decompress when you got home. You know, um, I, well, I wondered until I experienced it myself, what's easier? Is it easier to be local or easier to be far away? It's actually easier to be local. Oh, my God, yes. Well, and here's why. Because when you're local, there's something you can actually do. Yeah. A crisis comes right. and you're there and you can be yeah. active. Uh, you can drive to the doctor's office or you can visit in a hospital you, or you can cook a meal or you can clean the house. Mm-hmm. When you're distant, you can help. You can be moral support. You can Google and find resources on the web. You can counsel from a distance. 
but you can't do something that's active. And um, the stress of caregiving uh, creates a uh, actual biological drive to yeah. do something, yeah. to be active. I, I and so you can't follow through on that. And it makes being distant much more difficult. Yeah. Not only that, but there's another factor. Um, frequently, like a call would come in the morning and there would be a crisis and I would work for many hours to help resolve it. But then I would never actually get the call that said everything's okay now. Mm -hmm. So I'd be left wondering, yeah. is it settled? Is mom okay? You know, what does the doctor say? Um, I, I, I can beat that story. I was talking to a woman who lives in, in uh, Portland, Oregon. Her mother and father are in Hawaii. He's got serious uh, dementia. She's got uh, Parkinson's disease. She's got a sister who lives in, in uh, Hawaii who would, could otherwise be of help, but she has serious emotional problems. And this poor woman is doing it long. They're, they're both along in age. Uh, she gets to Hawaii whenever she can. She's married, got a family, holds a full-time job. Uh, she said she is so stressed out. She had to get psychological help to help her sort it out. Her situation is actually going to be increasingly common. And this is one of the ways in which caregiving today is different than what caregiving might have been in previous yes. generations. We in the US are the most mobile society in the world. Before COVID, we had the longest workday commutes. So that's one mm -hmm. aspect of mobility. But here's the other one. 40% of adult Americans live on average 700 miles from family. Mm -hmm. Okay, 20% of retirees relocate. So that distance breaks up all the networks. And so when we get to the caregiving stage of mm -hmm. life, if we ever do, that um, distance alone um, creates a real challenge for people. Uh, the other difference that comes to mind is at least one, maybe two generations ago, old folks never left the family. They, they, they were two and three generations living together. That's true. And in addition to that, um, they didn't live as long. Uh, what's happening today is we are going to live another 20 or 30 years of relatively healthy life. Um, but when we do that, we're not going to have a very large than close by family to help right. us out. Right. And there's another factor too, which is women are in the workforce. Mm -hmm. Women have been the traditional caregivers. Mm -hmm. So if a woman has a job, it's going to be far less possible for her mm -hmm. to help out in the sort of day-to-day -day needs of family caregiving. You know, this is kind of off script, but another question occurs to me since we're talking about demographics. Do you see the ascendance of, of uh, CCRCs continuing? Or do you believe that aging in place will become more prominent in the U.S. anyway? Aging in place is the preferred option for people yes. when you ask them. Mm -hmm. uh, there comes a time, it happened with us, um, even though we really wanted to help mom meet her goal of staying at home, where that just wasn't going to be possible anymore, mm -hmm. even with a lot of help. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And so you have to realize that. Uh, the challenge, though, um, not just with CCRCs, uh, but with every form of paid senior care is that it's oversubscribed. So even if you can afford it, you might not be able to get it. In addition to that, um, I also have studied um, people who've moved into what were either CCRCs or very close to it, mm -hmm. uh, thinking that this would be the mm -hmm. last of their moves. And they love the management company at the time uh, that was uh, providing them the services. Then the company changed hands. New management came in and now mm -hmm. they don't like the new management. So they're not as happy and they can't get out of their long-term contracts. And some of those sorts of things um, can happen as well. Or the chef changes and the food isn't as good as right. it used to be. Right. I've heard that complaint so many times. Right. So, and it's harder um, when you are older to yeah. um, have the energy yeah. to say, I'm just going to pick up and move. Uh, so they can feel trapped in a way that is very unfamiliar to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason that I even started to think about the longevity issue yeah. is because the first book, The Network Sage, which I wrote for working adults, yeah. um, seniors started to use it 
to figure out how to age in yeah. place. But then they would complain to me by saying, well, you know, it's written for working adults. Exactly. That's who I was thinking about mm -hmm. when I wrote the book. Um, but they said, we want our own book. And I thought, you know, they're right. Wouldn't yeah. it be great? And of course, now that I've seen my mother go through it, I mean, she mm -hmm. had decades of really vibrant aging. Um, she was a volunteer in eight different organizations. She ran a soup kitchen uh, one day a week, working a 12-hour shift mm -hmm. when she was in her late 80s. And loved it. And loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she was studying um, Middle Ages philosophy at a local university. Mm -hmm. She's the exception. Uh, She's well, not in my family. Uh, well, her mother. Beyond your family. Yeah. Well, her mother didn't start her last career until she was seventy-two, mm -hmm. and worked at it every day until she died at the age Great of ninety-two choice. at work. Great. Sign me up. That's what I want. Now, as we were saying, <laughs> explain or describe, and it's in your book, I know, but explain and describe networks and establishing networks and why are they are so important, especially today? Yeah. So networks are groups of people who have a particular and defined purpose in your life. But let me describe the eight. Once I do, it's going to make total sense to you. It's really obvious and intuitive. I didn't set out to find these networks, by the way. Uh, I was working with people, looking at all of the folks that they had in their lives, and then thought, I started with a list, but a list is really not a good management tool. So I started grouping them, and mm. sure enough, from the sociological and anthropological and psychological uh, perspective, they made a lot of sense. So altogether, there are eight networks that support working adults. The first five... That support working adults. Working adults. adults. Mm -hmm. Those are the people I was... Well, yeah. researching. Yes. Um, uh, as it turns out, though, these networks, um, I'll, as I'll explain, um, e e continue to support us later when we're no longer in the workforce. Okay. All right. And they, they've been built through mm -hmm. our life. So the first five of these networks I call birthright networks because you were born into them. Your parents created them for you. You created them for your children. Now, granted, um, you as a child and your children as children started changing those networks to suit themselves. But none of us will ever outgrow the needs that these provide. So here's the five. First, there's a family network. Second, there's a health and vitality network. Making sense so far? Mm -hmm. Third, an education and enrichment network. Fourth, a spiritual network. And then fifth, a social and community network. So, of course, when you're a kid, your community might be your neighborhood. As we get older, that community mm -hmm. gets bigger and bigger. And as adults, it's almost the world, right? Then you mature into three more networks. Sometimes your parents can help you build these, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I call these coming of age networks. The first one is a career network, which is where we usually think about networking. Yeah. And it's one of the things that you've excelled at and why we met in the first place mm -hmm. is through the career network. Second, there is a home and personal affairs network. Personal affairs is things like your car dealer, your banker, your accountant, your lawyer, people like that. And then finally, you have a network I call ghosts. Now, I didn't go looking for ghosts, but they kept showing up. Ghosts are people who used to be in our life who are no longer. Maybe they passed away. Maybe they moved away. Maybe your path just diverged, mm -hmm. right? I've tried to find my college roommate. I can't. You know, I just, we went our separate mm -hmm. ways and, and I can't find her anymore. Um, and so those are what I call life networks. They're enduring. That's why I they're for your life. But then you have another type. I call those event networks. Um, people will be familiar with these because they've had them themselves. Mm -hmm. You have a wedding. People come help you have the wedding, but then they pretty much leave. Or um, you have a baby and some people show up to help you and then they leave. Or you have a car accident mm -hmm. and now you need a repair shop. That's an event network. Is caregiving an event? Caregiving is an event. Um, it's an event event that lasts for a very long time. And it also has a whole variety of other sort of events within events yeah. um, that we could talk about as well. You know, in my open, I said that in my case, I had to reach for, I guess, the health because I was looking for help with medication. Mm -hmm. I think the scariest part of caregiving, being responsible for meds. Mm -hmm. 
I needed help with, with AIDS and so on. That was another, I know people in the home care business. Uh, anyway, I, I, thank God I was able to reach to several networks where I still have relationships. So within caregiving, there are, I think, groups of events that I think about. Some of them are about your family. Um, are there disputes within the family about how the care mm -hmm. should be cared for? Uh, and that's not uncommon. In addition to family disputes, though, there could be other disputes as well. There could be friends or neighbors who are second guessing what you're doing because they don't have all the facts. Uh, and so that can cause disputes as well. We had that happen mm -hmm. in our case with our mom. Um, the other events are the things that are the daily living needs that just have to get done uh, because you have to get a meal or you have to get a shower or all of those, those sort of daily need uh, things that happen. Um, the other things that you've already mentioned, all of the health and medical needs, those can be a lot of very separate events. Yeah. It could be a series of hospitalizations. Um, uh, one of my dear friends, um, father f recently fell uh, uh, in his bathroom, fractured his spine in mm. two different places, was in the hospital, but then for the all but the next uh, about week, final week of his life, went between the hospital and a rehab facility and then back to a hospital and then back to a rehab facility. Mm -hmm. Each of those is an event. And there are different people who could be involved right. um, each time. Of course, there's household maintenance. Uh, can you imagine those caregivers in California who are trying to get snow yeah. off a roof mm -hmm. at a time like this. I mean, those that's a very dire need, but even the sort of routine maintenance we do, where my mom lived, for example, mm -hmm. um, if your bushes are not properly trimmed or your grass is not cut, you're fined. So thank heaven my brother is close by mm -hmm. and he can do mm -hmm. it if, um, if need be. And then finally, there are an entire variety of legal and financial um, events. Mm -hmm. We were really um, lucky because my all of my mother's legal documents were impeccable. But that didn't help us when the time came to sell her car or when the time came to sell her house because the agencies are very alert today to elder abuse and elder financial mm -hmm. abuse. So it was really difficult for my brother to have to carry out those yeah. tasks even though we had all of the documents that yes. we needed um, to have in place. Yeah. And as I told you, uh, we covered some of that with the expert we had in elder, elder law a couple of mm -hmm. episodes back. She was very helpful mm -hmm. with some of the things you don't think about or you right. don't want to think about uh, because the uh, things you don't want to think about have to do preparing, like preparing for death. And we don't like to think about that. So 70% of American, adult Americans don't have an up-to-date will. Mm -hmm. That's part of that dynamic. And uh, one of the pieces of advice that I would have for everyone is, um, you know, you should assume that at some point in time you will become a caregiver. If you don't, you're, you're yeah. blessed. Um, but if you do, what you need to know is all the people in the networks of the carry, you're the yes. loved one, you may become responsible for. You need to know if they have the up-to-date will and so on. Um, and then you have to have that same information about your own networks because yeah. your life is going to change. It is going to be different. You will have to call upon people for help. What I have found in my research is that we all have far bigger networks than we know. We have far more help than mm -hmm. we realize waiting to to be mm -hmm. there for us, but it's they're hiding in plain sight. Yeah. We don't see them. Yeah. So that's why it helps to gather all of this information for the time that you might need it. What are the most pressing issues in your experience in the consulting you do uh, faced by caregivers, unpaid family caregivers? They're not prepared at all. And by the way, I wasn't either. I mean, this is not a criticism of anyone. If any three people should have been able to navigate better, it would have been my brother and my sister-in-law and I. They were hospice volunteers for 20 years and went mm -hmm. to nursing homes, right? I was a Eucharistic minister. I went to nursing homes for five years. Um, I've received awards for my work in Alzheimer's caregiving. 
And yet, when it came time, mm-hmm. I wasn't prepared. Yep. In fact, the first signal we had that something could possibly be be wrong, my mother uh, um, became seriously ill when she was about a five. Um, uh, she was in the hospital several times in isolation uh, on high-powered antibiotics. The first time that this happened, uh, my brother and sister-in-law were out of the country. They were on a cruise. I didn't even know a cruise line. And I slept through a phone call at night. I woke up to a voicemail that she had been hospitalized. I didn't know the name of the hospital. I mm. navigated from a thousand miles away with a telephone number for one neighbor. Mm-hmm. Now, she eventually recovered because I used my network, mm-hmm. found a group of nurse navigators who are local here. They're, they're called guardian nurse advocates. I knew from my work in healthcare about an experimental therapy. They got her into the clinical trial and it worked, Mm -hmm. okay? But as soon as she was okay, I will tell you what I did. I found everybody in my mother's life. I have their name, their phone number, their yeah, email address, yeah. and um, they're my first line of defense. So in after that, if my brother and sister-in-law were away and I couldn't reach my mother, I now know six neighbors who would be very glad to yeah. run across the street and check on her and make sure she's okay. Yeah. In addition to that, I took care of them. They got Harry and David fruit for Christmas. Yeah. They got Mother's Day cards. Yeah. And when that's very important. Nurturing. <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that's the advanced course in networking. <laughs> um, um, as you <laughs> pointed out right away. Um, and then when I was there in, uh, in Florida uh, caring for my mom, I did dinner parties and mm-hmm. I hosted them. Mm-hmm. So we had a relationship. Uh, yeah. Most adult kids can't say that about their parents. I talked with um, a friend the other day. She said, you know, if my, if my parents died, I wouldn't know where to start to tell their friends. I, I don't know who their friends are. Mm-hmm. How would I even find them to invite them to a funeral? Um, they don't have, we don't have that information. Yeah. yeah. We, we went through that with mm-hmm. Marlene. Mm-hmm. So the, and, and what, what we found um, is every event every emergency hospitalization or every, you know, real urgent care visit, whatever, we saw was just a one-off. We -hmm. didn't see that it was the beginning of something that would continue that we needed to get ahead of and prepare for. So by the time we got to the point of saying, she can't stay at home anymore and she needs to be in assisted living, we were running on fumes. And we didn't find the internet helpful at all. Um, the facilities in her area, if you look at them, there's some beautiful photographs and drone videos of gardens and fountains yeah. and things like that. But I wanted more. I wanted to know who were the leadership in this facility? Mm-hmm. Um, had they published anything? Mm-hmm. Um, were there any scandals I should know about? Uh, had they ever been sued um, for poor care? Uh, what did it cost? Couldn't find that. Uh, by looking at the web. It's not until you're actually talking to the actual providers themselves and until you're in the facility and you meet the staff yeah. that you start getting a sense of confidence. We were lucky. We found a facility that was new. It had only been open for a year. She got the last available unit. Mm-hmm. And they were just ex- wonderful. Uh, could not have been more excellent. But other than what you've already said, which most, of, most of which is tactical tactical, uh, task-driven, be sure you do this before you do that. Uh, you're into Zen, correct? I do a form of art yes. that's Zen-related. You're okay. right, yeah. But you touch on Zen, mm-hmm. a, a frame of mind and spirit. Mm-hmm. How does that help with caregiving? How has it helped you? There are a variety of things that can and do help people. Uh, for some people, that's exercise. For some people, that's meditation. For some people, that's prayer. Um, uh, for some people, even the very devotion to a loved one is a form of um, prayer almost, um, service, selfless service um, that, that helps. Uh, I think both my brother and I and my sister-in-law as well, we all had ways of coping with that stress, but ultimately we ran out of gas and it didn't work anymore. Um, so the, and, and I think that was the thing that surprised us the most is that we absolutely hit a wall. Uh, we had knowledge, we had, um, motivation and love for our mother to Mm -hmm. do everything that she wanted. But, um, uh, it was only in retrospect 
um, that my brother, I think, had a very helpful insight. He said, we did for mom what she wanted, not what she needed. Yeah. We were good kids. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, and we needed to, so we were adult kids and be in the kid part, yeah. We leaned on too hard. We should have leaned more on the adult part. Now, you cared for your your wife. And I think caring for a spouse is something that's very different than caring for a parent. Um, I think there are some different dynamics there. Yes. Uh, uh, but the... Um, um, so I, I think that the, the thing is that people need to find out what it is for them. And it needs to be healthy for them. Mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, we realized we wish we had made decisions that were good for the family, not mm -hmm. just good for our mother, because we sacrificed a lot of ourselves, our health, uh, my business, um, all of our relationships with other people. Yep. Um, uh, there, there were challenges there. Um, uh, caregiving is very challenging mm -hmm. um, to the caregivers. If they're in the workforce, mm -hmm. miss seven days more of uh, uh, work than non-caregivers, they cost their employers 8% more in healthcare costs because their health is not so good. And uh, their actual mortality risk, 30% of caregivers die before the person they're caring for yes. because of the stress. 40% <clears throat> die first if the care has Alzheimer's. And if the caregivers are over 70, 70% 70 die first. So. Uh, all of that needs to be a consideration. As with every one of these episodes, we in a half hour, we just barely scratched the surface. There's so much more to talk about. But thank you again for coming in. My guest today has been Glenna Crooks, who is an author, a consultant, an innovator. Uh, she, she is also good at network and networking. Yes. If you'd like to know more about Glenna and the work she does, you can go to her website, Glenna at glennacrooks.com. Until next time, this is Caregiver Assist. I'm Rick Anthony. Take very good care of yourselves. <laughs>